For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Amen, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Before Please uh, turn in your Bible or the order of service to our passage for today, verses 27 to 30 in chapter 1. Now here in my hand and in your hand is a fragment of this letter of friendship written by Paul to the Philippians in the first century AD. So let me tell you about the fragment of this letter which I looked at in Dublin on Wednesday afternoon. The preaching conference was over and I went to a museum beside Dublin Castle and there I saw a piece of the letter of Paul to the Philippians displayed in a glass case. Now it's uh, reckoned to be the oldest fragment and the oldest copy of Paul's letter to the Philippians along with some other New Testament uh, writings that there is in the whole wide world. This copy that I'm holding of the fragment of Philippians is just 48 hours old. It was photocopied on Friday afternoon by Maureen in the man's study. The piece of Philippians that I looked at in Dublin was, wait for it, 1,800 years old. Uh, handwritten, neat writing in Greek, on papyrus. The word awesome is overused much today, but I tell you there were goose pimples on the back of my neck as I realised this was such an ancient and precious piece of scripture. And you know, it was just a reminder to myself that continually I've got to convince myself and convince the congregation just how precious and priceless are these writings, the New Testament scriptures. No wonder this little fragment was under lock and key double-paned glass with surveillance cameras. There might have been a den of lions guarding it for all I know. So priceless was it and precious. And these writings that we're looking at, one of them being the letter to Philippians, are not only precious and priceless, they're powerful. It's a reminder to me to convince myself and convince the congregation that this hour is really the most relevant hour in the week for our lives. Not for coming to hear me, of course, but to hear this word of God, which actually does put strength into our lives and save our souls. Now, these writings are precious and priceless and powerful because they are gospel writings. And we, who are Christian men and women, are essentially and preeminently gospel people. And that's a line which is 
carried through the whole letter to the Philippians. And God has used that line to help people over the last 2,000 years to understand their identity and to understand how they are to live. So please look at me this, uh, with me this morning at two gospel mottos for gospel people which I find here in our verses. These are mottos which gospel people can carry around with them. One of them is what I call general and the second one is particular. Now mottos or pithy sayings are really quite useful for concentrating the mind on something. On Wednesday evening, Anne and I were staying in Dublin with a niece and her husband and uh, I noticed that they had a, a, a motto or a little text, I suppose you could call it, put on the bedroom door of their little baby with these words, babies are for getting adults up out of bed. Well, perhaps you've wondered what babies are for. Well, there's the answer. And I guess that wonderfully concentrates the minds of parents at six o'clock in the morning. So, our first motto. What I call a general gospel motto, that is to say it applies to all Christians at all times. The beginning of verse 27. Be gospel citizens, whatever. Well, that's not exactly what our fragment says, but that's what it means, I think. So let's read it together. Verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourselves. Now our word politics comes from this original Greek word and the verb meant conduct yourselves as citizens worthy of the gospel. And I feel sure that Paul deliberately chose this verb because he was writing to the Philippians who lived in Philippi. And the town of Philippi, though it was in Greece, was a Roman colony. People used to say that Philippi was Rome in miniature. For there the people spoke and dressed as though they were Romans. They lived in Roman-style buildings under Roman laws as Roman citizens. Which they were. To live in Philippi meant that you were a Roman citizen. And that was reckoned to be a tremendous honor and privilege conferred upon you in the ancient world. Now the Christians in Philippi were Roman citizens, but Paul wants them to think not only in this light, but he wants them to think as though they have dual citizenship. Now dual citizenship is, is not something that's terribly usual nowadays. I had an aunt who died just a couple of weeks ago and she went to live in Canada 55 years ago and she took out Canadian citizenship. Dual citizenship is unusual, but it's not unknown. I have a friend from Dundee who resides in Vancouver in Canada, uh, and he's going to settle there and stay there, and his family's there, so he's considering taking out dual citizenship, not only citizenship of the United Kingdom, but also of Canada. Now Paul writes to these Christians as those who were citizens of the Roman Empire, but more importantly, citizens of the Gospel Empire, of the Heavenly Kingdom. If you were to flip over the page, you would see that in chapter 3, verse 20, he says to them, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await a saviour from there. Amazing words. So the instruction in verse 27 really reads something like this. Paul is saying, conduct yourselves worthily as citizens of the kingdom of the gospel, whatever happens to you. Be gospel citizens, whatever. So there I'm suggesting is a general motto for all times. Now we as citizens of our nation are proud of our nation and root for it, most of the time, anyway. And particularly this shows itself on sporting occasions, and it's very natural to root for your nation. 
All of the Irish preachers at the preaching conference I was speaking at last week were very proud of the Irish rugby team. And they fairly glowed as they spoke of that marvellous and wonderful victory over the English at Lansdowne Road a week past Saturday. They fairly glowed. I'm not saying they crowed about it, but they glowed. And I glowed with them, and uh, I'd have to confess I probably crowed as well. Proud of our nation. So in calling us to conduct ourselves as citizens of Christ's gospel kingdom, he's calling us to be proud of it and to root for it and to represent it worthily in all our lives. Now in case those who are English feel that I'm leaving England out of the picture, let me say something positive about England. You remember at school, don't you, how we were taught what Admiral Nelson said to the English nation at the time of the Battle of Trafalgar. Remember these words? England expects every man to do his duty. It was a call to be good representatives of their kingdom and our Admiral King expects every Christian to do his or her duty and to live so as to enhance his gospel kingdom. Conduct yourselves worthily. That is to say, live as fits with, live as appropriate with the gospel. Now the word worthily here was used originally in respect of wearing clothes. Wearing clothes that were appropriate for a particular occasion. And that's very important, isn't it? If I was to go and dig the garden, if... If I was to go and dig the garden, I wouldn't put on my kilt and wear my sporran and my buckled shoes and my ski and do. That would be totally inappropriate. I'd put on old denims and trainers and uh, tracksuit top. You've got to wear clothes that fit the occasion. If you were invited to an evening wedding reception, you wouldn't turn up in a t-shirt, boxer shorts and flip-flop sandals. Unless it was a fancy dress wedding reception. I know we talk about dressing down nowadays, but that's ridiculous, isn't it? You wear clothes which fit the occasion. You wear clothes which become the occasion. So the old authorized version on this text says, Conduct yourselves as becometh the gospel. As fits in with the gospel. So there's the general motto for Christian people for all times. Whatever, be gospel citizens. But what does this mean in particular? Well, here I point you to the second motto that I find in the second half of the same verse, verse 27. A particular motto for a particular situation. Be gospel contestants whenever you are in the arena. Well, again, it doesn't say that here, but I think that's what it means. But let's read what it does say. Whenever I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Contending from which we get our word, athletics. And it does seem as though Paul in this paragraph is thinking about athletic games because in verse 30 he uses another word for the athletics contest. It's translated in our reading, struggle. And in Paul's day, the struggle of the athletics contest was viewed similarly to that of the gladiator's battle in the arena. Now, I haven't seen the film Gladiator, but I'm sure a number of you have seen it, and I noticed it was on Sky Television last night, the film where Russell Crowe won his Oscar for his role of Maximus. So... The picture of the gladiator contesting in the arena is really the picture that you should have in your mind's eye just now. Not 
rather the picture of the British athletic sprint team in an athletic stadium as they try once again to run without dropping the baton. Put that picture out and think of the gladiator because that's really the picture that uh, Paul is wanting to portray. Now, what is this imagery pointing towards? Well, what we are to understand by this is that the Philippian Christians were facing a very hostile arena as they lived in Philippi. The public authorities and their pagan neighbors were putting tremendous pressure on the Christians to acknowledge Caesar as the divine emperor and to renounce and reject Christ as their divine king. Now in this hostile arena, as far as the Christian gospel was concerned, how were Christians tempted to react? And the answer is in verse 28, by being frightened of those who oppose them. Now that's true for a multitude of Christians in our, in our world today. That's true for Christians in hostile Pakistan this morning. That's true for them as it was for Christians in hostile Philippi. And it's true also in Scotland today. Young Christians in a hostile high school arena. New Christians in a hostile office or staff room or factory floor and feeling very much all alone and uh, tempted to be frightened. And with this temptation, what is the tendency? Well, the tendency is to zip the mouth and put your head right below the parapet and become an invisible Christian. And it's a very natural reaction and tendency and temptation. But Paul says, don't be frightened. Don't be frightened by those who oppose you. The word here means don't panic. It was a word which was used of a horse being startled suddenly by a noise or a movement. And if anybody's done any riding of a horse, then you'll know that the panic is not confined just to the horse in such a situation. I've not done really anything of this. I can only remember once um, being on a horse in North Devon. The horse was called Fairy. Don't laugh. And I remember it suddenly started to gallop. So I tell you, it was scary on Fairy. Panic. In such a situation, you're liable to be thrown. And in the panic moment that Christians were facing in the hostility of their particular arena, they were liable to be thrown and to become silent as witnesses. And Paul says, don't be frightened. Be gospel contestants whenever you're in the arena. Now, of course, it's true to say that, generally speaking, there's a lot of fear around just now in our world situation. And it's a, a fear that's experienced at all levels in society. One Wall Street trader in America um, remarked on last week's bizarre decision to suspend a session of Congress, remarked that the politicians have a new slogan, don't panic, we'll do it for you. Well, panic reactions are common just now. And it's all very well for Captain Mannering and Dad's army to say, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. But for Christians in Philippi and Christians in Christon, it's a very real temptation as they face hostility to the gospel in any walk of life. And there is hostility to the gospel in our world today and in our country. You're not supposed to say so, but there is. And we trust that Islamic clergy in our country who have been vocal in seeking new legislation to protect their right to worship in freedom, and rightly so, rightly so, but we hope that the same Islamic 
clergy will be as vocal in speaking out about the rights of Christians to have freedom to worship in Islamic countries and to speak out and to condemn the terrible violence and persecution and murder that's happening just now. You know, Mr. Blunkett, the Home Secretary, will have to be very careful in framing this new law against inciting religious hatred. He must ensure that in this country, Christian people are free, peacefully and respectfully to contend for their 2,000-year-old faith. In the same way that Paul is calling the Philippians in their hostile arena to contend for the faith. But of course, most of the hostility um, to the gospel happens informally and locally and personally. As Christian people meet a whole variety of obstructiveness. You see, people deep down still hate Jesus Christ and his gospel as much as they ever did however cultured and respectable they might be. You just have to put the slightest challenge to them and then you see the fur flying. Paul says, don't be frightened by your opponents. Don't panic. Don't be afraid. Be gospel contestants when you're in your arena. So there's the particular motto as well as the general one. Be gospel citizens, whatever. Be gospel contestants when you're in your arena of hostility. So the question I want to close with and think about for a moment is, what is it that God would have us be and do as we take in his word this morning? You know, this paragraph is full of 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 exhortations and imperatives. And I see here Paul as a kind of sergeant major in the parade ground giving directives. Now what directives would God bring to our hearts and minds this morning? Well, first of all, I think he would say to us, be consistent in your Christian faith. So do we consciously try to tie up what we do with what we say? Do we try to fit our personal choices with the gospel standards? Do we try to line up our priorities with gospel goals? Do we try to make our weekday ambitions align with our Sunday profession? And when we do view our inconsistencies, Maybe speech or language we use or habits or pursuits or or, or leisures or whatever. Do we view them with horror and address them and try to deal with them radically? Do we see how much impact living the gospel has made upon people's lives and history? You know, the early Methodists not only taught their people how to die, but they taught their people how to live well. Do we see how important it is to make the Christian gospel attractive to hurting people? And there's no shortage of hurting people around us. It was Lord Tennyson who wrote, Never morning, war to evening, but some heart did break. And that's true of the people that we rub shoulders with in our community, in our neighborhood, at work. And those hurting people will be drawn, I believe, to attractive, consistent, gospel living. Be consistent. That's the first thing I think God would say to us. The second thing I think he would say is, be united. This paragraph is addressed to the church as a whole, not to members as individuals. And so Paul says, stand firm in one spirit. That's to say the Holy Spirit who binds Christian people together. He says, stand firm contending as one man. That's to say inwardly sharing the same ambition to advance the gospel. 
You know, when I was a small boy, one of my favorite films and favorite games, consequently, was The Three Musketeers. Do you remember them? And D'Artagnan? And do you remember their great war cry and slogan? All for one and one for all. Well, are we all for one and one for all in the church as we seek to advance the gospel in our community, defending it and promoting it in our parish? Will we put aside our personal views and the views of our group? Will we put aside any tendency to disharmony and disunity that prevails so that we can actively, positively and consciously work as one, as one for the gospel? That's important to say with important meetings coming up and important decisions to be made. Working for the gospel, or are we perhaps becoming more and more passengers as far as gospel work? And yet perhaps still a bit critical. You know, I love uh, the words of D.L. Moody to church leaders in a congregation when he was being very strongly criticized for his particular brand of evangelism. And D.L. Moody said to them, well, you know, gentlemen, I prefer the evangelism I do to the evangelism you don't do. Be united about the gospel. That's the second thing I think God would say to us. The third thing I think he would say to us this morning is be long-sighted. Don't be frightened. Don't panic in the face of opposition with opponents, but rather be pitying as you consider the end. For in verse 29, the apostle says that hostility and opposition is really a twofold sign. First of all, it's a sign of eternal destruction for gospel opponents and secondly it's a sign of eternal salvation for gospel believers so we need to get on our binoculars and we need to see the end we need to look at the goal of all things far off I see the goal O Saviour guide me be long-sighted, be pitying and compassionate upon those who oppose the gospel. And the fourth and final thing that I think God would say to us this morning is, be Christ-focused as you consider your sufferings, verses 29 and 30. That's to say, be cool, calm, collected and confident that Christ has privileged you to bear some little form of suffering for his sake, for the gospel's sake, in order that he might bring something good out of it for the gospel's sake. Be cool, calm, collected and confident as you see the privilege that Christ has given you in joining that mighty line of heroes through the centuries, the apostles, the prophets, the martyrs who have suffered just a little bit for Jesus' sake. In other words, focus upon Christ. Last week, we were thinking of the words, for me to live is Christ. So can I ask you, in the seven days that have passed since last Sunday, has your focus become sharpened and crystallized the more on Jesus? Be gospel people through and through, holding these gospel mottos. And so much hangs on it, you know, and so much blessing for the church and for our lives flows from it. May the Lord bless his word to us and write it upon our hearts and enable us to respond to it. Let's pray. We come to open your word, to read it, to think about it, so that we might take it in to our lives and then go out the door with it in our lives to live by it In the days that are ahead, we pray for help, O God, 
to allow our minds, first of all, to chew it over, and to allow our hearts to be examined and with openness and honesty to receive it so that we might be inspired the more to live worthily of this glorious gospel of the blessed God. God, help us to do that and to be worthy citizens of the heavenly kingdom and courageous contestants in an evil and dark and hostile world. Give to young folks in particular who trust in you that courage and faith to stand up for Jesus and to believe in him and to witness to him. We need your encouragement. We need your help. And we pray your word will provide that for us today. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.